Good evening. This is Anne Adams representing the Mission Group for this mission theme service where Emlyn Williams will be preaching. We are grateful for our long association at PBC with Emlyn. His ministry for many years was with Scripture Union, both within the UK but latterly in Eastern Europe, travelling widely to help and encourage fledgling Scripture Union groups. We look forward now to hearing his message to us. Hello, it's nice to be with you again. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, strange circumstances, aren't they? There's strange circumstances everywhere. Uh, I have the disadvantage of not being able to see you. On the other hand, you have the great advantage of not having to look at me. So I hope that you can just uh, stay tuned to my voice as we look at the scriptures together. Trisha and I are well. Uh, we are about to move from Milton Keynes, where we've lived since 1996, apart from a brief time in Southampton, to rural Norfolk. We're going to the country. So uh, let's see how that works out. Uh, some of you will be more familiar with living in the country than I am, although Trisha, of course, was brought up in the countryside. But today uh, we're going to look at a passage from Acts, Acts chapter 8, and a famous story of the gospel spreading again to a new group of people. So let's read it together, Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they travelled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water, what can stand in the way of my being baptised? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptised him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and travelled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Well, to lots of us, that's a very familiar story. It's been with me since childhood, uh, and I've uh, come closer to it and further away from it at different times. But this morning, it's a, it's a passage which gives us some clues about how the gospel comes to people and how the Lord might be leading us forward into the future. So you might like to keep your Bible open at that passage, or if you've not got that far, pause, press the pause button and get a Bible and open it so that you can keep a check on what I'm saying. What I want to do is just a very brief introduction, then I want to walk through the passage, just look at some key points from it, and then finally look at some ways in which it applies to us today and some lessons for us, some questions for us as to how we might respond to it. From the very early days of the Christian church, weeks after uh, Pentecost, only weeks after Jesus' death, and resurrection. And to say that the church had exploded is definitely no exaggeration. From 120 people gathered together on the day of Pentecost to 3,000 who came to the Lord that day, and then on to more than 5,000. There were Jews from Palestine, 
There were Jews from the diaspora spread around. There were Samaritans who only had the books of Moses. There were Ethiopian Jewish converts with, who had the prophets as well. All of these people had come into the church. The gospel really had exploded. And Philip had initially found himself in Samaria, but now he was about to move, about to move south. And the key to what was making the gospel spread at this point was persecution. The believers left Jerusalem, many of them, to escape persecution, and through that the Lord brought the gospel to new places, to new people. That's something we've seen around the world, isn't it? The way in which places which have experienced persecution have also been places where the gospel has spread and grown. Look at China and the way that uh, after the communists took over China and the missionaries left, the church exploded. And there are so many Christians in China now and uh, many people are seeing China as the place where uh, it would be key in the spread of the gospel and is key in the spread of the gospel now. So let's just walk through this passage and see what there is in it for us today. But first of all, let's pray and ask the Lord to open it to us. Father, we thank you for the scriptures. We thank you for the way they instruct us. Thank you for their encouragement. Thank you for their challenge. Help us, Lord, to hear your voice today as we look at this passage. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in verse 4... Um, of that chapter we see that Philip had been taken away from the revival that happened and he was sent off to a desert road verse 26 now an angel of the Lord said to Philip go south to the road the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza I don't know whether he actually said go south young man but it was a bit like that wasn't it Philip is another of these people who simply obeyed God's call not knowing where it would leave lead Abram was the same wasn't he all that Abraham heard was to leave, leave your land and go to the place that I will show you. But he had no idea where that would be. So often we want to know the end of the story before we start the beginning. Uh, but often God doesn't work that way. Often God starts us off on the way and only later reveals to us where it's leading. It's a question of trust. It's a question of dependence. Well, Philip probably was very sad to leave the revival in Samaria. It was exciting there. Things were happening. But the exciting place is not necessarily the right place to be. God had a purpose in Philip leaving Samaria and going somewhere else. It was about 60 miles, not far in the car, but if you're walking or even in a chariot, it's a bit of a journey, isn't it? And Philip obeyed God's messenger, went south, and he met an Ethiopian. Well, Ethiopia, to people at that time, seemed like the end of the earth. Uh, to us, it's probably not the same Ethiopia that's on the map, but it's the upper Nile region of Aswan down to Khartoum. You might like to check that on a map afterwards. And the Ethiopian he met was almost certainly black. In fact, this man was probably, as far as we know, one of the first black people to come to Christ. He was a eunuch, which is often a name for a key servant, but also literally a eunuch at this time. His sexual identity was ambiguous. Uh, he, was, um, uh, f he, he had very different uh, pressures to the ones that many other people have when it comes to his sexuality. Uh, one uh, writer said this, crossing socio-economic borders between and the outcast, the elite and the outcast, only made the eunuch that much more of a figure on the edge, trusted yet treated with suspicion, prosperous yet ostracised, the powerful whose access to power, ironically, came only through his humiliation. And eunuchs were regarded as impure, Deuteronomy 23, 1. They couldn't come near. They were limited in how close they could come to God, it seemed. This is the kind of person that Jesus, that Philip was directed by the Spirit to approach, a social outcast, living on the edge in terms of his sexual identity, his religious identification, and his socio-economic status. So although in many ways he had a comfortable life as, a, as an important official in charge of the treasury, nevertheless, he was someone who was on the edge, someone who didn't quite fit 
wherever he was. He was also a Jewish convert. Verse 27, he had been uh, to Jerusalem to worship. He was limited in what he could do when he was in Jerusalem because of who could go where in the temple area and uh, eunuchs were not allowed to certain places. But nevertheless, he was, to the best of his ability, a faithful Jew, a convert, and an important official, someone with status. Certainly he'd got the company car or the company chariot and the company driver. But the Spirit told Philip, verse 29, Go, near, go to that chariot and stay near it. I've just got this lovely picture in my head of Philip running along and running up to the chariot and keeping jogging along so that he's evenly placed next to the window of the chariot. Who knows whether it was like that or not. But uh, whatever it was, Philip obeyed, he went to the chariot and he stayed near it. And what he found was very interesting. He found that the man was reading Isaiah the prophet. And you notice it says that he heard the man was reading Isaiah the prophet. Silent reading that we've all been taught to do at, uh, at school, and, and it's quite an achievement for lots of us. Silent reading is a new development. Most people in history have read aloud, and this was no exception. Uh, this man was reading the book of Isaiah, the book of the prophet Isaiah, aloud, so Philip had no problem knowing what it was that he was leading, reading. And so F Philip's question wasn't, what are you reading? It was, do you understand what you're reading? And that was just the question the man needed. He said, how can I, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. So Philip could stop running, get into the chariot and have a ride. This is the passage from Isaiah 53. Very familiar, one we will hear over this Easter time. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. As a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. He went further than the scripture to Jesus. He told him the good news about Jesus. And so as they travelled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch wanted to be baptised. Which is what Philip did. He responded to him. He didn't say, you've got to come to a class. Or he didn't say, let's, let's wait a few weeks until we're clear that you've got a real commitment here. Uh, he simply responded. The Ethiopian gave orders to stop the chariot. Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptised him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again. But he went on his way, rejoicing, because he had found the Lord. Philip, on the other hand, appeared at Azotus. I love that phrase. Philip appeared at Azotus. He was taken away to Azotus. I wonder what it was like for Philip. One minute he's there in the water with this easy open. The next minute he's somewhere else. How did he appear? It raises lots of interesting questions, doesn't it? But he appeared at Azotus. He travelled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. There's one thing about Philip. He was faithful to the gospel. He took the opportunities to preach and to lead people to Jesus. So here's this fascinating little story. Hardly anyone involved, hardly any witnesses, but here we are 2,000 years later reading about that experience. And this story, I think, leaves us with two questions at least. One, of that, one question is, where are we in the story? Who are you in the story? Are you Philip? Are you the Ethiopian? Where do you fit? Let's have a look at the difference between the two of them. Philip was simply obedient to God's direction. He didn't say, no, it's all happening here in Samaria. I don't want to go. It's, uh, this is where I need to be. 
he heard God's direction to leave, to go south, into the desert, and he went. Maybe that's something some of us are struggling with at the moment. We've got a sense that God is directing us in some way. Maybe it seems a crazy thing to do. Why would God want us to do that? Why would God want us to go there? Why would God, what God want us to leave this job and take that job? The point is, Philip was simply obedient. Because he was ready to listen. He, he was attuned to God's voice. He wanted to hear God's voice. He wanted to hear God's direction and God's instruction. And above all, he was ready to point to Jesus. That was the key thing. It wasn't about the Ethiopian joining the church. It wasn't about membership. It was about Jesus. And sometimes we get a bit diverted by that, I think, don't we? We can have all sorts of plans and ideas for people, and we're concerned for the gospel, certainly. But do we actually simply point people to Jesus? That's the lesson from Philip. He was ready to point people to Jesus. But the Ethiopian, I think he is a fascinating and great example to us. He was someone who was searching for God. He had become a Jew. He was a convert to Judaism. And uh, that reflected something, I guess, of a search for God. And he was reading the Bible. In my notes, I wrote, even reading the Bible. I don't know that that's... Um, maybe the right word I mean it's a pretty obvious thing to do if he was searching for God and he was a Jew what did the scriptures say about God whatever he was searching for God he was reading the Bible and secondly he was asking questions and that's a key element in looking for God searching for God asking questions and I think it's a great start when people have got questions the important thing is to start with the questions and then look to the answers. But having the questions in the first place is absolutely central. This man was asking questions. He'd read this Bible passage and it left him with questions and he wanted someone to answer the questions. And lo and behold, this man runs up to his chariot, knows what it is he's reading and can explain it to him. Isn't God good? Wasn't God good to the Ethiopian? But not only was he asking questions, he was humble enough to listen to the answers. Even though he was a powerful man, even though he had great authority and influence, he was willing to listen to Philip's answers. And he didn't know who Philip was. He didn't know Philip from a bar of soap. This could have been anybody who turned up at the side of his chariot. And yet he got in the chariot and he seemed to understand what this passage from Isaiah was all about. And the Ethiopian, and interesting, we don't know his name, the Ethiopian was humble enough to listen to what Philip said. But even more than that, he was ready to obey God. It's one thing to listen, it's another thing to be ready to obey. People will often listen to the gospel, people will often hear what God's got to say to them, but when it comes to going further, and to doing something about it, then they run into problems, but not the Ethiopian. He was ready to obey God. In the last couple of years, I have um, made contact again with someone who I knew well when we lived in Australia many years ago, and Laurie Barton was, he was actually chair of the committee that I served, and he was a, he was a Baptist minister, still is a Baptist minister, though he's recently retired, but he was a school chaplain. And uh, he moved from being chaplain at a Baptist school to an Anglican school, a very Swiss Anglican school, quite a high-powered Anglican school. And uh, they coped somehow with having a Baptist as their chaplain. Well, Laurie got in touch with me because he'd had a fascinating experience with one of his students. And this student is called Peter, and he is Chinese. And he had signed up for a confirmation class in the school. Now imagine it, this is a confirmation class in an Anglican school led by a Baptist minister. And a Chinese boy, Peter, signs up for it by mistake. And I say by mistake, it was by mistake because he didn't realise what it was he was signing up for. He thought that this was sort of some sort of group that would go on trips out. 
Instead, he found it was a group to discover more about the Christian faith. But he faithfully went to this group. And at the end, he came to Christ. And Peter's story is the most remarkable story, really, because he has faithfully gone on since then. He's from, as I said, a Chinese background. His father's a Chinese businessman. Uh, he's got business in, in Beijing as well as in Australia. There's a family home in Australia and in China. They're quite wealthy. Uh, but Peter has gone on with the Lord ever since that confirmation class. And uh, he's had his ups and downs. And Laurie Barton has done a fantastic job of looking after him, caring for him, discipling him. And I came into contact with Peter because a couple of years ago he was about to come to England. Peter is, is actually a very, very talented footballer. And he was coming to England to go to a football academy in Stamford in Lincolnshire. And uh, Laurie Barton said to me, do you know anybody in Stamford who I could put him in touch with? Well, as it happened, I've got a friend who used to be a minister in Stamford. So I got in touch with him and he put me in touch with the with his successor in the church in Stamford. And he said that he would look after Peter if Peter made contact. I emailed Peter. Peter didn't know who I was from a bar of soap either. I emailed Peter to tell him about this. And Peter read the email while he was standing in the immigration queue at Heathrow Airport. What a lovely welcome to England to read an email that says people are looking out for you, Christians are looking out for you, and waiting for you. Well, it gets even better, because Peter made his way to Stamford somehow, and uh, he decided he wanted to find out where this church was, uh, so that he could go the next day. So on the Saturday, he got a taxi, he found the church, sat in the taxi outside looking, and the house next door to the church was where, where the vicar lived. And while Peter is sitting in the car, the door of the vicarage opened and a man came out. And the man went up to the taxi and he looked in at Peter and he said, Hello, Peter. Are you the Peter I'm looking for? He's this man Peter has never met who knows his name. And I think that vicar was being a bit like Philip, really. He was being obedient. And God put him in the right place at the right time. But the really strange thing is that afterwards the vicar said that he... he didn't know why he went. He just heard a noise. He thought there was someone at the door. Well, there wasn't anybody at the door, but that alerted to him, and he opened the door, saw the car there, sensed that this might be Peter, went and chatted to him, and Peter got involved in the church. Peter subsequently went back to Australia. Then he came back again for a second stint in England, and this time he was with the West Ham uh, Academy, and he was living in Romford, and again we linked him up with some Christians in Romford. Then he went back to Australia, and then to Beijing and for a good bit of last year he was in Beijing and again we were able to link him up with Christians in Beijing so he could join a church and grow more in his faith but now Peter is in Croatia and he is uh, on the books of a second division Croatian team and uh, lots of challenges for him living there but he's got a contract to the end of the year but the great thing about that is the way that God has looked after Peter here is Peter who out of the blue comes to faith in Christ by mistake, in fact, a series of mistakes, really. But the Lord takes him, cares for him, looks after him. I'm still in touch with Peter. I had a lovely message from him last night where he sent me a picture of him with, uh, with, with a, a coach from the club and his new shirt with his number one on it. He's a goalkeeper. And Peter is now playing for this team in Croatia. And uh, so Peter is somebody I'm praying for and looking for what God might do through him. What could God do through a talented Chinese footballer in Croatia? I don't know, but I expect God does. Well, we need to be ready, don't we, to listen to God, to obey God, to follow God, just as Philip did. And the great thing about Philip, or the challenging thing about Philip, is that Philip also got out of the way very quickly. In fact, he didn't have much choice about it. God took him out of the way. He disappeared, appeared in Azotus, and carried on doing other things. But the great thing was this Ethiopian, this distinguished Ethiopian, his questions were answered. He understood this passage that he'd been reading and it made sense and it pointed him to Jesus and he was baptised. He went on his way rejoicing. But I wonder whether he carried on reading in the book of Isaiah. Because a few 
chapters later, Isaiah also says this. Let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, The Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant. To them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. God gives people on the edge, people who are excluded, people who don't fit. God gives them hope. And I wonder who the people are around us who perhaps feel that they don't fit. Perhaps we feel they don't fit. Perhaps we don't see that hope for them, but God sees them as people he loves, people who Christ died for, and he wants to give them hope, a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. That's what God offers to those who turn to him. So there's the challenge for us. Are we obedient to God's direction? Are we ready to listen? Are we ready to point to Jesus? And are we ready to obey God? I pray that uh, those things will stay with you over these coming days and that you will perhaps be led also to people who might eventually go on their way rejoicing because they've met Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Emlyn, for your inspiring and challenging message. We wish you and your wife, Tricia, every blessing in your retirement.